Well, welcome to Thursday. We have an early show today, and joining us in the studio is Judge Shackley Raffetto. Welcome to the show, Shackley. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Glad to be here. And we have uh, on the line uh, John Cam. John Cam is the uh, CEO of Dewey Wa, which is a uh, foundation uh, operating out of uh, Hong Kong, is it, John? S San Francisco. Yes, San Francisco. Kong. And San you're, in San you're in San Francisco now, and we connect with John uh, by Skype. Uh, and we're going to talk about Dewey Wa and find out how it got organized, which is a very exciting story. We're going to find out what it does, what, what programs it has, what challenges it has, and finally, what its relevance is in today's world. I would say be prepared to hear that it's an increasing relevance. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, why don't you introduce John Shackley? Sure. Uh, uh, John and I met in, uh, recently uh, as a result of uh, me actually waking up in the middle of the night and surfing the internet, I uh, had a, a um, problem I was working involving China. And uh, uh, after reading uh, the information on the website, which is doiwa.org, a very extensive website, um, I got in contact with John. He was kind enough to respond right away. And we have uh, uh, communicated by phone and internet since then. And he's been very helpful. And I was so impressed with his organization that I thought right away that this would be a great interview for ThinkTech Hawaii. And so John was kind enough to make himself available today. And I'm looking forward to sharing, ha having him share uh, what his organization does and, and what he, uh, some of his uh, uh, interesting uh, um, adventures, I would call them. Uh, he often goes to China and does some very interesting things. And so maybe we could start there by asking John to sure. maybe give us a brief overview of uh, what Dwei Wa does and, and maybe how you got started. Welcome to the show, John. <clears throat> well, thank you, Jay, and thank you, Shackley. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on your show. Uh, Dwei Hua uh, was uh, established uh, in 1999, but the roots of Dwei Hua go back to 1990 uh, when as an American business leader based in Hong Kong, uh, I intervened on behalf of a young political prisoner. Mm. That was my first intervention. It took place in May of 1990. At the time, I was vice president of a large American multinational uh, headquartered actually in Dallas, but uh, Hong Kong was the regional office. And I was concurrently the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. Uh, now, how I came about to interview, intervene on behalf of this young man uh, has to do with um, uh, the struggle in the United States uh, over whether or not to give China, uh, or I should say to renew China's preferential trade status, known as most favored nation. Mm -hmm. Uh, your viewers doubtless will uh, recall that uh, in the spring of 1989, a uh, period of great uh, upheaval in China, uh, protests across the country, and that culminated in um, the army, and the Chinese army, moving into Tiananmen Square and clearing it of the students who were occupying it uh, to this day, we don't know how many people were killed, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was really, looking back, it was one of the uh, real wake-up calls in terms of human rights, uh, not only in China, but globally. Um, just, as a, just as a little bit of an example, you may recall the iconic picture of the man in front of the tank. Oh, sure. <laughs> well, that was Tiananmen. <laughs> Uh, and it really uh, launched CNN, as, as uh, so you can, uh, you can look at the whole development of cable news mm -hmm. as being connected. Mm -hmm. I would also say that uh, a little uh, public affairs station called C-SPAN mm -hmm. also started around that time and in fact covered the very first congressional hearings on China's trade status. Mm -hmm. Now, by way of further background, I don't want to go on too long, but the United States is the only industrialized uh, democracy in the world that puts the authority over foreign trade in the hands of the legislative branch. Mm. And there are very interesting historical reasons for this. 
back when our, our Constitution was drafted, uh, it was not unusual for countries to be at war with each other and trade. Uh, and so the founders put authority over foreign affairs in the executive branch and foreign trade in the legislative branch. Now, today, Very that, interesting that, point, yeah. Mm. It sounds quite crazy, but that <laughs> is the fact. Mm. So anyway, Congress had authority over whether or not to grant China most favored nation. And uh, after what happened in Tiananmen on June 4th, 1989, Congress was not inclined mm -hmm. to, put it to renew China's trade standards. So hearings were called for May of 1990. And uh, I was among the very few people who uh, was invited to attend the hearings uh, in, in favor of renewing China's trade standards. So on the eve of my departure for my testimony, I was hosted at a banquet. A senior Chinese official toasted me. I interrupted the toast and asked him to release a young political prisoner mm. whose name I had just heard on the radio on the way to the, the banquet. Uh, so I went, I testified, I came back to Hong Kong and uh, uh, China's status was renewed. Mm. Well, let's examine the moment you stood up, <clears throat> because that wasn't too long after the Cultural Revolution. Um, there had been some real trouble in Tiananmen. Uh, it wasn't clear whether uh, you know, China was going to be civilized or not so civilized about this kind of thing. Uh, uh, it was on the edge, wasn't it? And you were at some risk, weren't you? Indeed, that, that is the case. Uh, when I intervened on behalf of that young man, uh, the Chinese government had never released a prisoner mm. in response to foreign pleas. So this, what I did was without precedent. And I must say that the reaction of the business community in particular was uh, pretty negative. Uh, basically what I was told was that uh, you would fail. Uh, no Chinese uh, government official would ever uh, do something like releasing a prisoner because you, John Can, are asking him to do so. That mm. would constitute a massive loss of face. And mm. so that won't happen. The other thing I was told is that your business uh, would be uh, ruined in China. Mm. Well, uh, those critics were wrong on both counts. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and it turned out that, in fact, that was the beginning of my first intervention. Um, I've never really looked back. Mm -hmm. It's been more than 25 years. I've intervened on behalf of between five and 6,000 prisoners. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I haven't helped all of them. Uh, I've certainly helped several hundred. But I think the most important thing to point out is that, to the best of our knowledge, uh, no one has ever been hurt mm -hmm. this activism. And uh, quite, I think, uh, extraordinary is the fact that I maintain to this day very good working relations with the Chinese government and its judiciary, mm -hmm. as well as all the different human rights groups and foreign governments. So uh, we have, uh, we as a foundation, have continued our work in the area of political prisoners, which remains our core business. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, and I'm sure your viewers will be interested in, in hearing more about the work we've been doing in recent years on behalf of juvenile offenders and women in prison, mm -hmm. as well as people uh, awaiting uh, execution, uh, the death penalty. So we work in these four areas. I see. So you're, you were inspired by that initial experience to actually go forward and create a nonprofit corporation which uh, would dedicate itself uh, to, the, to the work that you had begun uh, by the incident that you just described. That's, that's, uh, that's the history, basically? Yeah, I would, I would say that's a good, uh, good summation. Um, you know, people often ask me, well, why, you know, why do you do this? Mm -hmm. You know, I gave up 
very promising business career, I was in line to be president of a Fortune 500, Fortune 100 company, mm -hmm. which I gave up to do this. And my response is, why wouldn't I do this mm -hmm. if I can do it? You know, I mean, why do you climb Mount Everest? Because it's there, because you can do it. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it is the case that the Chinese government, even to this day, uh, and they've told me this repeatedly, that I'm the only person they will talk to about human rights. And Shackley, you know that. Yes. I'm able to go in and intervene on behalf of prisoners. And I do it a lot. I did I, it last night. I've done it, uh, I would say, every week. I'm working on two or three cases. Well, that's an extraordinary role to play. It's extraordinary yeah. to have them accept you in that role. And my question would be, how, how do you achieve that? Can I do that? Can Judge Raffetto do that? Uh, there must be some special sauce involved here, John. Well, I think, first of all, you have to uh, bear in mind that uh, had China lost its trade status, uh, and I've said this in China publicly, there would not have been this great Chinese economic miracle. Mm. If China had lost access to the American market, it would have forfeited trillions of dollars in foreign exchange uh, which they have. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, this is a very crude analysis, but if you were to add up all of their trade surpluses with the United States over the last two or three decades, uh, that would roughly uh, be equivalent to their foreign exchange reserves. So there is that sense, and when I go to China, I am constantly reminded of that by Chinese officials mm. who say we will never forget this. You know, we will always be grateful. So that's been the trade-off. Now, I'm not naive. That's not the only reason. In fact, uh, reasons change um, all the time. Uh, I remember after, after Bill Clinton came into office, and uh, a year later, he uh, delinked human rights and trade. And I went to see an American senator mm. who had voted actually to uh, take away China's and uh, then changed his position. He was a Democratic senator. And as soon as Bill Clinton came in, he changed his position. Mm. So I went and I asked him, and his response, I think, is uh, very apt and relevant to today. He said, uh, John, uh, we've used MFN uh, to the best of our ability. It's helped uh, secure the release of many prisoners and some other interesting benefits. Uh, but we've kind of run out. You know, we, we, we played that as long as we can play it. He said, but I'm not worried. China is a developing country, and it will always want something. The job is to find out what that is and how much China is willing to pay to get it. And so it might be a membership in the WTO. It might be the state visit of an important uh, leader. Uh, to the United States or a foreign country that they want to make a success of. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and I could give you many examples of, of that. Long after they secured permanent most favored nation, they were still um, willing to make human rights, I would have to call them gestures, mm -hmm. uh, to achieve uh, their goals. China is a very flexible power. Uh, it will do what it sees in its best interests to do. Uh, unlike the image, it's not some monolithic, doctrinaire, uh, communist country. But I think I see the special sauce, John. The special sauce is that you have to create an exchange of value. If you say, uh, do this because we want you, that may not work. If you say, do this for better relations in general, that may not work. But if you identify something on the plate that they want, like most favored nation, or I'm sure there are many other things, and set that up uh, as a businessman, uh, as an exchange of one thing for another, you're much more likely, likely to succeed. And so I would suggest to you, you can agree or disagree, that the special sauce you bring to this kind of transaction is you can identify the consideration that interests them. Not everybody can do that. 
I, I think that's fair. I would add a couple of things. Uh, first of all, um, you know, we should never fall into the trap of thinking that just because, you know, they're Chinese officials, almost all of whom are Communist Party members, that they don't care for their country, that they don't care for rule of law. Mm -hmm. They do. Uh, they very much do. And they do want to see China make progress in the direction of rule of law. Mm. So one of the angles is to to use the law uh, to uh, advance, um, in this case, resolution of cases. There's actually an expression in Chinese, uh, and as Shackley knows very well, China is not a common law country. So mm -hmm. uh, cases don't have the same weight. They don't carry the same precedent. That's not to say, though, that how cases are resolved doesn't influence the thinking of other cases. Mm -hmm. In China, the phrase is ian uh, shuofa, uh, which means to use cases to talk about the law. Mm -hmm. And so there's that aspect. But the other thing you mentioned there, Jay, which uh, something I have to point out, um, you know, I come to this as, as, as someone with a business background. Uh, and when I say business background, I go way back. Mm. My father was a whiskey salesman. <laughs> you know, my father was too. Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> that was was that during Prohibition, John? <laughs> and I learned how to sell. <laughs> and basically, I'm a human rights salesman. Uh -huh. That's what I do. Mm. I sell human rights to China, and uh, I used all the tricks. It, you know. You know, the salesman, when he goes in, he makes a call, he knocks on the door, he's got a bunch of encyclopedias, he's trying to sell the little lady of the house, if I can use that expression, and she says, no, 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 I, I'm sorry, I don't want that. And, you know, the salesman, and she's about to shut the door, and, and he puts his foot in the door, and he says, you know, I understand, madam, but uh, I'll be back. <laughs> I always tell people this, the most important thing you can tell your Chinese host is A, when you're leaving, and B, when you're coming back. <laughs> Very important. Without, Strategic without information. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, John. Uh, you know, we, we know from uh, this discussion and, and what we find in print uh, that you're working on political and religious prisoners, juvenile justice, women in prison, and selected issues in criminal justice. But do you, is there a boundary? Do you handle every single detention, or do you draw the line somewhere? And, and what kinds of detainees would you not be interested in helping? Okay, well, let's first of all take political and religious prisoners. Uh, obviously, it's, it's not possible to work on every single case. We probably only know the identities of maybe 10% of their names. Mm -hmm. And when I say we, I mean Dwey Hua. We maintain the world's largest database of such prisoners. Uh, so we work on individual cases or classes of cases. We generate prisoner lists. I might bring a list of journalists who are in prison when mm -hmm. I go to China, or house church pastors, or Catholic priests, or Buddhist monks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So while I can't, I certainly cannot say we work on every case. We do work on a lot of cases, um, and some of those cases do have implications for other cases. Now, when you get into the areas of juvenile justice, women in prison, and the death penalty, well, the death penalty, certainly, we have adopted cases, and we've had a mixed record on that. A few of the cases we work on, the verdict was overturned. On others, we failed. Mm. Uh, but the but the the main so you have in the death penalty area you have two two approaches first the individual cases for instance there was a case of a woman by the name of Li Yan and she killed her abusive husband okay she was sentenced to death and a domestic and international campaign uh, took place and that verdict was overturned mm. now that has had big implications for women who are the victims of domestic violence, who fight back and kill their abuser. So you, you do have that kind of connection. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, you may not know this, but the number of executions that take place in China, which is more than any other country in the world, in fact, 
all the other countries combined don't add up to China, uh, the exact number is a state secret. However, we, Weihua, uh, when we feel that we have enough data points to make an estimate, we release the estimate of the number of executions. Mm. And the Chinese government is very sensitive to that. So they have an incentive, they have many incentives to lower the death the rate of, of executions. But one of the incentives is international opinion when those estimates come out. So we think that about 2,000 people are executed in China every year, all right? 30 years ago, it was uh, 10 times that. Ah, interesting. More than 10 times. Interesting. So they've been bringing it down, and we've been part of the effort. That's now, great. M moving a bit on, on juvenile justice, that's another big topic. We can talk more about that. Mm -hmm. But they have actually reformed their law to uh, bring their juvenile justice system in line with our own. Mm. And we've been very active in that area. And finally, in women in prison, uh, you know, there's a real worldwide problem here. The number of women in prison is soaring mm. much faster. In China, the rate of increase is 10 times that of men mm. for women. So we've been campaigning on that, that issue as well. When you say we, John, are you, do you have a force of people? Do you have a group that travels and writes and does what has to be done? And, and uh, I guess the second part of that is, uh, how are you funded in Duiwa? Well, those are two good questions. Uh, first of all, I do have a good team. I'm very proud of my staff. I have two offices, one in San Francisco, one in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. total 11. And I have... Uh, total, total how many? 11. I love. 11 people. Um, now, uh, we have people who focus exclusively on research and publications. Mm -hmm. uh, as I say, we maintain this massive database. By, by the way, let me interject here. On the website is a wealth of information uh, about all kinds of topics, in particular developments in the law and in criminal law in China. Uh, that information is not easy to come by, and, uh, uh, but if, you ch if the listeners uh, check uh, the, uh, the the website, they'll find a, a lot of information. Yes, and so thank you. Again, it's www.duihua, D-U-I-H-U-A, dot org. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, so I have people who do research. I have people who administer our grants, which I'm about to talk about when you how, how we fund it. Uh, you know, we, we, we filed reports to our grantors on a regular basis. And of course, being a 501c3 nonprofit, mm -hmm. I can assure you our accounts are audited very strictly because our dear friends in the federal government do not like to give up uh, the opportunity of, of getting tax money out of you. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, actually, we are funded uh, by, I would say, uh, three principal means. First, government grants. We get a grant from the State Department mm. uh, for our database, and we get grants from four countries in Europe, annual grants, and from time to time we get uh, project-specific grants. So Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway have been giving us grants for years. Mm. Our work is very well known, very popular in Europe. We have, we're the only independent uh, human rights organization that has consultative status with the United Nations. Mm. I go to Geneva a lot. I, try, I just came back from Europe about a month ago. Mm. Uh, so there are government grants. Um, and then there are private foundations. We get grants from private foundations. And that's probably the smallest one. But this year, for the first time, the largest single source of income for Dwayne Hua are individual donations. Mm. People who just take out their checkbook or go to PayPal and they give us a donation. It can be $50, $100, it can go up to obviously several thousand. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we work very hard on that. I, this year, about one third of all of our income will come from private donations. And I'd love to see that go up to 50 percent someday. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The less I have to depend on government, the happier I am. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's 
That's outstanding. We have uh, uh, five or ten minutes left, and I wondered if we could get into sort of the global landscape. You alluded to that before about how uh, some of the countries in Europe uh, are behind you. Uh, I know there's an organization associated with the UN uh, that tries to deal with unlawful de detainees around mm -hmm. the world. Um, and I know, for example, just driving in this morning, um, that there's a fellow, uh, a Wall Street Journal reporter, uh, who's in jail in Iran now for 500 days, and nobody knows why. Uh, what I'm saying is um, maybe we didn't know it before, but we certainly are finding out now that there's an awful lot of illegal, unjustified um, detainee activity around the world. And I wonder where you feel you fit in all of that. I wonder what you think about the trends going on, the dynamic of the, the whole process of the, the detainment, and also the efforts on organizations like you to, to terminate that detainment. And finally, I'd be very interested in knowing whether you would consider operating outside of detainees in China. I mean, why not go to Iran and try to get that journalist out of jail? Well, you know, going back to an earlier question, uh, the reason I can do what I do in, in China has to do with a 40-year history of involvement with the country. Mm -hmm. When I first went to China exactly 40 years ago, uh, I attended the funeral of Zhou Enlai. I was in the big Tangshan earthquake, you know, so I go way back. And, mm -hmm. you know, the Chinese really do respect, um, I hate to say old age. There's some benefit, huh? It's a great expression in Chinese. When you drink the water, remember who dug the well. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's very Chinese. If I were to go to Iran, I've never been there. I don't know the country. I don't know the language. Um, you know, I would, I would have really no special place to intervene. You know, I would probably ask the Chinese government to help. That's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> that gives you some mm -hmm. idea. And maybe now, they would. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, back to the other part of your question. Well, again, since we have UN status, uh, and I go to, to Geneva uh, quite a bit, uh, yes, we make submissions to these various groups. The one you refer to is known as the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. But they have a Working Group on Enforced and involuntary disappearances, etc. There are now so-called, these are called special mandates, and there are more than 50 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been involved with several of them, and we continue to be involved and, and to assist. Um, now, there are the complicating factors, obviously one would have to be the war on terror, uh, which not only obviously in China, but around the world, there's been a blurring of that line Mm -hmm. between rights and security. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing it in our country every day, and you're certainly seeing it in China. And the Chinese government, like us, we justify things because we're involved in something called the war on terror. Mm -hmm. And certainly that has made uh, the work of human rights groups more difficult. But I want to point out one other thing that just shows you how connected the world is. And, and that is the refugee crisis in Europe. And I've just returned from Europe, I've seen it firsthand. You know, it's, it's a continent in conflict with itself. It's very, very tense. Mm. One of the implications and consequences of this refugee crisis in Europe is that those governments that support the work of groups like Dwe Wan, not just in China, but around the world, those governments, their budgets, are under tremendous pressure. Uh, I'll just as an example, Sweden is going to take in maybe 250,000 refugees. Wow. And they give me a grant. Norway is going to take 50 to 60,000. Now, in per capita terms, these countries are taking in more than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And their budgets, you know, a year ago, they didn't know they were going to do this. You know, when they made a commitment to Dwe Hua to give such and such an amount of money, they had no idea that at this point, they would be looking at budget cuts. Now, these people, like our own politicians, have to look at their constituents. And what are you going to do? Cut medical services, cut education for your own people, so you can support humanitarian groups overseas? It's a big struggle. 
I anticipate that groups like Joy Vaught will take a bit of a hit. And that's where the individual donations come in. Mm. Like I said, I want to get to the day where we really don't have to rely too much on governments, although I must say I'm very grateful to the governments of Scandinavia and Switzerland for all the help they've given us. But I also appreciate that they are now ripped by this terribly, terribly tragic crisis. So I have to try to be understanding mm -hmm. and meanwhile work like the Dickens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Built up that base of individual donors. Well, could you comment on the dynamic of it? It seems to me that when you started this work after Tinnaman, uh, there were not many people or countries involved in getting people out of jail. And now there are more. And the success is obvious from, say, 10,000 to 2,000 uh, releases. That's quite an achievement. Um, but do we have a dynamic going on globally where more people are being incarcerated, more people are being detained or less? and more organizations like yours or, or government organizations are involved in trying to get them out. I mean, which way is this going? Well, I would say in, in terms of China, uh, yes, initially uh, governments uh, were more effective in um, persuading the Chinese government to release prisoners, especially the American government, when it looked like, you know, MFN wasn't finally settled in, until about 2002. Mm -hmm. So during that period, up to say 2001, uh, yes, the Chinese were more prone, and then they got permanent MFN, and it appeared they'd be less willing. But then, of course, 9/11 happened, and uh, this has hardly been examined. But mm -hmm. one of the results of 9/11 was China actually releasing their most high-profile political prisoners. Mm. And again, this runs counter what we might think, you know we need them more than us. I mean, you know, when George Bush went to China, he was sort of hat in hand. He wanted the Chinese to support his, his efforts on the war on terror. And they could have stiffed them, or they could have said, well, okay, we'll help, but quit this human rights stuff as part of it. But on the contrary, they didn't. And the reason was they saw the opportunity to build on what had happened a better relationship. You see? So they're very strategic in their thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say in recent years, governments have been less effective um, in securing the release of political prisoners in China. Uh, I am fortunate in that I can still do that. But you see, I'm not a government. Mm -hmm. The Chinese line on me is, you know, John Kim is not a government. If, you know, if the government of, of the United States comes and says, do this, do this, do this, we're a government, they're a government, who are they to tell us? Mm -hmm. John Cam comes and he's not telling us anything. He's laying it out, he's asking us, he's a friend. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they've said, we'd rather do something for a friend than somebody comes in here, points fingers, and you know, names and shames. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, in that sense, it's more difficult. Worldwide, as I've mentioned, no question, the war on terror has in fact resulted in more people in detention than it would be otherwise. I don't think there's any question about that at all. Mm. Uh, so that, the trend is not a good trend. Um, and, and, and that's something we're, we're, of course, very worried about and concerned. Yeah. Well, are you uh, committed to this for life, John? That was my question. Uh, <laughs> are, are, you, uh, are there others in your organization that you take with you, or do you offer internships for young people who might be... Uh, inspired by the work that you've done to, to try to learn about it and to carry on? And uh, are, you, are you doing something to pass the baton on to um, people who will follow on from you? Well, you know, I've, I've, I've looked for a successor for many years. Um, you know, I, I was told by the Chinese government that uh, after I pass, that's it. Mm. They will not uh, continue these kind of discussions on prisoners with anyone else. As one official put it, you are an historic figure. <laughs> so, you know, I, it was like reading my own obituary. Yeah. So I don't see that. But to answer your question, now we're working in these other areas as well. Mm -hmm. And if it's a question of finding somebody who can carry on the work on juvenile justice, which is, we haven't really talked about it, which is so important, mm -hmm. really important to the future of all society, yeah. how juveniles are treated, mm -hmm. uh, women in prison, even the death penalty, yes, I can have a successor. I'm always on the lookout. 
I have promising people, all of whom are at least 20 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. And to answer your question, something I'm very proud of is we are asked all the time by young people whether they can intern or volunteer for us. Mm -hmm. And these are the cream of the crop. I mm -hmm. want to tell you, they, a young lady just contacted our office in Hong Kong. She's a JD student. She's worked for various NGOs. She's fluent in several languages. Mm. She's a, a, a writer, a journalist, 25, 26 years old, and she wants to come work for us. Mm. And you know, when you see that happening, that's when you know you must be doing something right. Yeah, that's, that's a very nice story. compliment, yeah. Uh, Shackley, we're about out of time. Can, okay. you, can you summarize and uh, say farewell to John and, uh -oh. and say farewell to our listeners? Okay, well, I d thank you very much, John, for taking time to interview today. I, I could see we could probably do at least 10 of these interviews uh, to cover at least some of the territory that your, uh, that your organization uh, uh, provides. I would like to just remind our, our listeners that this is, the website is an excellent source of uh, developments in the law in China, and I highly recommend it to them. And John, uh, it's great to see you in person, and uh, uh, at least through the magic of Skype, and I look forward to meeting you one of these days in San Francisco. Keep up the good work, and thank you so much for, uh, for your effort and for all of your good works. Take care. Thank you, Shackley, and thank you, Jay, for making this uh, possible. It's been a wonderful opportunity. <laughs> okay.